In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Every year that I come to worship at, on All Saints Sunday here at St. Dunstan's, I am struck by being part of this community, by being in a group of people who bring their joys and their sorrows, their hopes, their present, their past, and their future here and bring them to God for God's mercy, for God's goodness, for God's grace. I love watching you. I wish that you could all sit up with me up there because watching people come and light these candles is an amazing experience. I imagine it's also an amazing experience from where you're sitting because we come with so much when we do that. We come with sorrow. We come with loss. We come with memories. And we come with hope. When I was asked to preach today, I immediately knew what I wanted to preach about. Well, obviously, All Saints Day. But I knew that I wanted to preach about something that I say when consecrating the Eucharist. And it is as old as the churches almost, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. We laud and magnify your holy name. I want to go back to that. That's actually the theme of this sermon, but I want to talk about a few other important parts of All Saints Day and what we believe goes on. I want, so I want to know how many of you would like to replace me this morning and explain exactly what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. Oh, Chris, he's preaching on this question next Thursday. So he's ready to do it. Sorry, Chris, you can't have my place. But it is actually really difficult. There are people who are really sure that they know what's going to happen. I am not one of those people. A lot of theology has been written. And the Episcopal Church is great because do you know what we believe about what is going to happen when Jesus comes back or when we die or what heaven is going to be like or all of these questions that surround All Saints Day? We believe what is written in the Nicene Creed. Jesus will uh, ascend it into heaven, sits on the right hand of God from whence he will judge the quick and the dead or the living and the dead. And we believe in one church, one baptism, one, and then, uh, boy, I wish I had my Nicene Creed in front of me. Um, but basically, we have very few things we believe in. We believe that Jesus will come back. And we believe that there will be the resurrection of the body. And we believe in life everlasting. When I went to seminary, I, I learned a lot about what the church has believed in in different times, not the Episcopal Church, because we have that little bit that we have as doctrine, but the church in general. And you are welcome to take notes, and if you can come back and pass the test, I will be very impressed. But for example, this is what I learned, that the book of Revelation explains every bit of this and that there will be a, a, a millennium, and there will be a rapture, and there will be a pre-millennial rapture or a post-millennial rapture. There will be a tribulation of a thousand years, and that will happen either before or after the rapture or during the rapture. And uh, we can be sure of all of that. Got it? The Catholic Church added that 
we will work our way out of our sins through purgatory. And purgatory actually means purging ourselves of our sins. It's not in the book of Revelation, and I actually haven't found it anywhere else. But, okay. Um, I had to write a paper at the end of a very long course on pre, post, mid, trib, rapture, etc., etc., on what I believed. And it had to be a 10-page paper. And I finished that paper in about two minutes. It had a cover sheet. And it said, give me oil in my lamp. And I wrote that what I believe is that Jesus said, I don't know the day or the hour or the time when I'm coming back. I don't know when this is going to happen or how it's happening. If Jesus doesn't know, how am I supposed to know? And the main thing that Jesus said is, be ready. Don't be a foolish virgin. Be a wise virgin. Have oil in your lamp and be ready to go. Remember that? We're coming up to Advent, and that's a major theme of Advent, to be prepared. And so I said, that's what I believe in. That's it. I had nine pages and seven-eighths left to write. And my professor gave me a failing grade. He said, that's not good enough. You have to know what you believe and why. And so I wrote nine pages and seven-eighths of what everyone else believed and ended up with, give me oil in my lamp. But how we understand isn't the real question. The real question is, what hope do we bring? And who is God in the midst of this? I think one of the reasons we are part of a faith community, that we believe in God, is that if there is no hope, if this is all there is, then there, then why bother, in a way? If this is all there is, I, I have a, a dear cousin, and when her mother died, I did the funeral in a cold cemetery in Estonia, and my cousin, when it was over, said in German, the monkey is dead, The lid of the coffin is closed. We will never speak about this again. Affe tot, klappe zu. And that made me so sad because she loved her mother. And her mother and she had memories and joys and, and this wonderful relationship. And it's now been 26 years And she doesn't speak about her mother because she has no hope in what is yet to come. And yet that hope is what I saw you bring in your lit candles. Or if you didn't get up and light a candle, I saw it as you sat amongst others lighting candles. A hope in a God who is able to raise Lazarus from the dead. A hope in a God of mercy and love. I have a a friend whom I preach about a couple of times a year at least, um, and I hope she never shows up here because she will recognize herself then. She's 93, and she has been a faithful Christian for 93 years, basically. And every time I talk to her, She says, I don't know why God keeps me alive and I don't know what his purpose for me on earth is and I don't know if I'm good enough to go to heaven. And my response every time is the same and she can't remember it, which is because God delights in you. God created you. God has a relationship with you, and you have a relationship with God. And that is the purpose here. That's why God has you in this. And she goes, oh, yeah, that's a good point, isn't it? And the next week, she said, I don't know why God keeps me here. I don't know why God does this. Our image of God 
is so important in what we what we experience here, what we see here and hear here. Is God a God of mercy? You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you lit a candle for someone where you said, I hope that this person is with God? In the several hundred funerals that I've done, how many people have asked me, is my uncle George saved? Is he okay? Will I be okay? And I pray that we will come into a deep sense of the mercy of God, the grace of God, that God, God's the judge. And I don't see God as going, oh man, in 1953 you could, took some candy from the store on the corner. And that's it, folks. I hope you didn't do that. You could. But but that we will see God as this forgiving God, as a God who longs to have us with him in eternity and in now. This longing relationship. So I want to go back to this question of what I pray over the Eucharist every time in the Eucharistic prayer. And believe it or not, we're not praying it today. We're using Eucharistic prayer C, and it's not in Eucharistic prayer C. How did that happen? But, and so with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your holy name as we sing, and then we move into the Gloria. The Sanctus, I mean, that one. The, the second Gloria. Holy, holy, holy God of power and might. And we move into that. I, I tried to memorize this, but instead I'm going to read this to you. This is a, or I hope I am. Yes. This is something that was written by Herbert O'Driscoll. Herbert O'Driscoll was an Anglican priest in Canada. He was born in England um, and went to confirmation classes in England. And this is, if I can find it, there it is. This is what he wrote about these words with angels and archangels. He tells a story that he was in a confirmation class with the rector of the local church. He was in a boarding school where the pews were hard, the lessons were hard, the food was bad, and the beds were old. And once a week he got to go to confirmation classes at the rectory where the rector's wife brought cookies and juice. And they got to sit on a soft carpet and learn about the love of God. He said, on this particular Thursday that I will, be, I will be given a gift that has proved lifelong. Each of us has a book of common prayer and a Bible. The rector directs us to open the prayer book at a certain page. He then asks one of us to read from that page. And a boyish voice reads, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your holy name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory be to you, O Lord Most High. The young reader's voice falls silent. Very quietly and deliberately, the rector speaks to us. These are very powerful words. Do you know that when these words are said in church, something wonderful happens? If you look towards the communion table, you will see the wall behind and the great window beyond fade away. And you will find yourself looking out at a vast host. 
Among them you will see creatures from every part of God's creation. You also see angels and archangels. And then you see a great throng of people. Who are they? You are looking at all those who have worshipped God before us and still worship God in heaven. Countless generations. When we say these words in church, we join in that great song that they are singing. Just for a moment in time and space are, are opened and we all worship God together. Then the wall and the window return and the moment is past. But it happens every time we say with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven. When we worship together, and bring those who have loved us and whom we have loved, when we bring our hopes and our fears, when we bring our theology, who is this God? We are part of that great throng of witnesses, angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven.